Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to worship. Those of you who are online with us as well, welcome. Welcome to this time of coming together to praise God together. I invite you to join me in the lighting of the Christ candle. Those of you at home, if you have a Christ candle in your worship space, I invite you to find it and something to light the candle with and join me as we pray together. Jesus Christ, light of the world, shine upon us this day. Shine into the stained glass windows of our gathering space here. Shine into the windows of our homes, the windows of our hearts. Thank you. Shine into our neighborhoods, our families, our communities. Shine into all those places that we gather together and those places that we find ourselves alone. Let your light so shine on us to fill us with the joy of life, we pray. Amen. This morning's prelude, the author is Andre Crouch. And he wrote and recorded this song that we're about to hear in 1972 after being encouraged to read John chapter 17. The man who encouraged him was a man he met in a Los Angeles teen center. They met that first day that Andre worked at the center. And that teen, Larry, had just been released from San Quentin prison. He wanted nothing to do with God, but he liked music. So he liked to hang around while Andre played. And eventually he did become a Christian. Years later, this man, Larry, called Andre. He said, I dreamed about you. He said, I dreamed that you would write a song that would go around the world. Read John 17. And so Andre did, and the next morning he woke up singing, To God Be the Glory, and then he began to write my tribute. Let's listen together, To God Be the Glory, To God Be the Glory, To God Be the Glory, for the things he has done. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please join me in the call to worship. We gather in the presence of God to encounter love that sets us free. We do not come seeking crumbs of justice, but a way of life that liberates. Together, we practice courage in resisting evil and rejecting the temptations of complicity and complacency. The Spirit leads us in power and truth. Our faith is placed in love eternal that lifts broken spirits and brings new life from places of ruin. With hope that is neither narrow nor fragile, we come to follow Christ. I invite you to stand and let's sing together our opening hymn 401. Thank you, Stephanie, for leading our song. of Christ be with you all and I invite you to offer some kind of a signal of the peace of Christ to each other a warm and welcoming smile on your face a wave uh, something like this peace be with you everyone peace of Christ and peace of Christ also to those of you who are gathered with us I see you peace of Christ Christ One of our traditions, one of our family customs is to offer the prayers, the joys we hold on our hearts, the concerns that we have on our hearts with one another, asking for the community of faith to pray for us. And so uh, I do offer this as a time that if you are 
online and you would like to speak a prayer request, if you could unmute yourself and then speak it and then mute yourself again so others may speak. If you are in person, Nelia has a microphone and she'll come over to you and you can speak it directly into the microphone. Um, I, I would like to uh, start by just giving you a heads up joy that we will welcome a friend on the 22nd of August, Michael Spath. Michael shepherded our trip to Israel-Palestine in 2015. He's taking another trip in 2022. He's going to be here on that Sunday in the pulpit preaching and then following worship. He's going to do a bit of a travelogue of his journeys to the Holy Lands, which is fascinating. He takes he sets up the most amazing trip and he's doing another in 2022. So if you're interested, and even if you're not interested in going, please join us after church to hear about some of those um, visitors that we will visit with, the people that we meet with. Um, we visit both the, um, the uh, sacred sites of Jesus and the living stones, the people who live and work and worship in that land. So if there's a group that wants to go from here, I may well go again. It's that great a trip, a kind of once in a lifetime. Other joys and concerns you have this morning? From um, Alzheimer's effect and his wife, Lisa, and his kids. Thank you. We offer prayers for Kurt and Kurt's family in this time of loss and grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. My, is this on? Yeah. My new uh, uh, friend, Stephanie Yossip here, turned me on to Ancestry.com last Sunday. And I think in the last three days, I put 60 hours into it. And I was able to find my ancestor, Benjamin Jones, uh, slave inventories of his plantation in Tennessee. It was a cold cannonball in my stomach. So that's a lifting up, you know, just really this quest, right? Quest for family connections, for ancient family connections through Ancestry.com and others. Several of you have done this. Um, my son has done this as well. Very, very interesting things we learn about our roots, what formed and shaped us over the years. Thank you for that, Ruth. I'm Kathy Winter. Um, I just like to ask for prayers for safe travel. My daughter and her family are traveling up north to the Upper Peninsula for a five-day family camp out, which should be a lot of fun, but just pray for their safety and that it turns out the way they want it to. <laughs> I'm almost jealous that I can't be there. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. A lot of people are traveling at this time. I think people are, are getting out because they haven't gotten out. A lot of people are traveling, moving around, and so we really do pray for traveling mercies, for safety. For those who are traveling to be together, traveling to different places for safety and for, kids, for, for care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Anybody else? Any other concerns? Well, gracious God, we know that you hear those prayers that Rest upon our hearts, those that are spoken and unspoken, and we trust and we delight that you are with us always, that you shepherd us through the joyful and the hard times of life. And so we thank you for your presence among us, your grace that showers down upon us. Amen. So I'd like to invite children that are with us this morning. I'm seeing Alina. I'm seeing Nevea. Come on down if you would, or up if you would. I want to talk just a little bit about shepherding at the time of Jesus. I've got some props. Come on up. A long time ago, uh, my mother gave me this corn husk shepherd and these little corn husk sheep. They're very delicate and dainty. They've lasted though, so I'm just going to use them and tell you that you want to hold him? Do you want to hold him? Do you want to hold one of the sheep? Okay. Want to hold one of the sheep, Nevaeh? 
super gently, super gently, like he's a baby bird. Want to? Yeah. Okay, in the land where Jesus is from, they do not have fences that are set up for the shepherds to take their sheep to graze. They have to take them way up into the wilderness. So will you come over here with me? I'm going to set up a few things. Maybe bring him too. Bring him too. Bring him too. Okay. So we're going to come over here. And I don't know if you all out there will see, but, but I'll try to make it so that. So let's pretend this is still water. And let's pretend this is a nice little grassy place. And the shepherds would lead every morning their sheep up into the wilderness to find that nice grassy place to eat and that nice still water to drink. So if we want to just have a, a shepherd leading this, this one up here, one of the shepherd, one of the sheep. But, you know, the wilderness is a very big place, and sometimes sheep wander off, and they get away. So maybe one of you have a sheep that wants to come over here, or over there, on its head. Okay, so we'll take a sheep over here. Well, we've got a couple of sheep that are wandering off. So the shepherd does his best to keep everybody together, but sometimes the sheep wander. And when a sheep realizes, they look around, when a sheep looks around and says, oh, I don't see my shepherd. I don't see any other sheep. And they get very scared. And what the first thing is that they do is they go hide. They hide in a bush like this. They hide and then they cry. They go like, something like that. What do you do? Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been lost? What do you think you would do if you got lost? Cry. I think I would too. Hide. I think I would too. Especially because when a sheep is by himself or herself out in the wilderness, they are in trouble. So they hide to try to protect themselves and they cry. But you know what? They hope, they hope that the shepherd finds them, hears their cry and finds them before a wild animal does. Because, you know, wild animals know that cry, too. And they know that there's a sheep that they can get. So, so that's what's going on in the wilderness. And the shepherd, so we got, and the shepherd hears it, right? And searches out for that sheep, comes up here, finds it. And you know what? Sheep, when they're scared, they can't walk. They're just, they freeze. They can't walk at all. So you know what the shepherd has to do? Shepherd's so excited that he or she found the sheep and the shepherd has to put this, and they're heavy, they're heavy, to put this sheep up on their shoulders like this. And maybe you've seen pictures of this where they, they put the sheep up on their shoulders because that's the best way to carry it for a shepherd because they're so heavy. And then they make their way back to the flock. They carry that sheep all the way back. And I want to tell you, this was such, a, such an important story to the very, very earliest people like you and me, Christians, who used to not meet in sanctuaries and churches like this, but in caves, that they would paint on the walls of their caves this picture of a sheep on the shoulders of the shepherd. Look over here. These are pictures that, that archaeologists, people who have dug into these old, old ancient caves in Rome, found on the walls of the caves. You see that there's a shepherd there's two different ones of shepherd with the sheep on the shoulders, see, and the sheep down of the rest of the flock. This, what they wanted to teach the people in the caves was that Jesus is our shepherd. And whenever we are lost, Jesus seeks us out to find us, to carry us, to hold us and carry us back. Isn't that an amazing? So they wanted to put that on the walls so that the people would remember that story and remember that image, right, of Jesus carrying us close. An amazing story, isn't it? Will you pray with me, you guys? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the faith of our ancestors. Go all the way back, uh, those earliest Christians who wanted each other to be encouraged, wanted each other to be hopeful by these pictures of Jesus carrying sheep, coming back to these stories of the Bible of Jesus carrying us when we're lost, carrying us and bringing us back to safety. We ask for your protection for these littlest lambs, for Alina, for Nevea, for Lane, for Finn, for our littlest lambs. And, and this morning for the Tracy children who are out sick, we ask for your care, for them to bring them safely back to the fold. 
In Christ, the good shepherd, we pray. Amen. Thank you, you guys. Thank you. Shall we put, the, we'll put these right back there. scripture reading this morning. So this is a preacher in the making right here. She wants to come right up here, doesn't she? Our scripture reading this morning is a psalm. It's a prayer attributed to David. David, the shepherd who also has Psalm 23 attributed to him, a shepherd who became king. Now, David, at the point of this Psalm 51, he has wandered. He's made some very bad decisions. He's abused his leadership. He's betrayed people who trusted him, his wife, the people that he was serving as king, his military. He's betrayed his God. He's, and these betrayals, these decisions he's made have led to very bad consequences. So David is lost. Restore my soul, he prays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. This is the prayer of a broken heart and Christians throughout Christians and Jewish uh, people throughout the history of, of the Jewish and Christian religion have used this prayer as a prayer of confession. It's the liturgy that appears in Ash Wednesday. For David, it's a prayer of a broken heart an empty spirit, overwhelming grief and shame. We might even imagine David, this great king alone in his chamber on his knees, tears streaming down his face because he knows now that God sees all that he's done and sees all that he is. Does God's blessing in him remain even still? Let's come into a time of stillness as we reflect upon our lives and our thoughts, our words, our actions, the things we've done the things we've left undone. You know, the psalmist says, even before a word is on our lips, God knows it completely. We are seen. We are fully known. And we are loved well. Grace to the divine blessing that is steadfast and sure. Listen with me to these words from Jan Richardson. From the moment it first laid eyes on you, this blessing loved you. 
This blessing knew you from the start. It cannot explain how. It just knows that the first time it sat down beside you, it entered into a conversation that had already been going on forever. Believe this conversation has not stopped. Believe this love still lives. The love that crossed an impossible distance to reach you, to find you, to take your face into its hands and bless you. Believe this does not end, that the gesture once enacted endures. Believe this love goes on, that it still takes your face into its hands, that it presses its forehead to yours as it speaks to you in undying words, that it has never ceased to gather your heart into its heart. Believe this blessing abides. Believe it goes with you always. Believe it knows you still. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Who among you, asks Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, who among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that one who is lost until he finds it? And then when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and all of his family and says to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. This is the story. This is the image that Middle Eastern scholar Ken Bailey says is at the heart of today's phrase from the 23rd Psalm about lost sheep hiding out there somewhere, vulnerable, alone, off track, crying out in despair. And then the relentless pursuit of the good shepherd, hearing the cry, moved with compassion, searching, searching, and then finding and rescuing and holding and carrying and bringing back home, celebrating, rejoicing, this is the image around which the oldest Christian communities formed their identity when they met in those caves to worship God. Today, we continue our exploration of Psalm 23 with the phrase from the King James Version, he restoreth my soul. And instead of restoreth or restores, or even revives, renews, refreshes, Ken Bailey joins the ancient Aramaic and Syriac translators who say it is about bringing back, bringing the lost back to the flock, to the fold, back to the right path, back home, back to life. Bailey wants that ancient beloved image that was front and center for the oldest Christian communities to come back front and center for us today, that, the, that good shepherd bringing back the lost sheep on those broad shoulders. He argues actually that bring back is a more faithful translation to the Hebrew. The verb is return and here it's found in its passive form. So it's, as we said before, unable to walk unable to get back on our own power, the Good Shepherd brings us back, back to the right path. It's a prayer we cry, bring me back. It's a cry 
Bring me back. Bring back my soul. And what is soul to the ancient Hebrew people? It is that life force within us. It is that which is uniquely me, my yearnings, my passion, my life blood, my breath. Bring the life back to me. Bring that life you created for me to live back within me, that life, that joy back within me. Maybe you remember the hit song of the rock band Evanescence, Bring Me to Life. Maybe you didn't know it, but it wasn't specifically written as a riff on Psalm 23. But if you listen with me to a few of the lyrics, it could be. How can you see into my eyes like open doors leading you down into my core where I've become so numb without a soul? My spirit sleeping somewhere cold until you find it there and lead it back home. Wake me up inside. Call my name and save me from the dark. Save me from the nothing I've become. Breathe into me and make me real. Breathe me. Bring me to life. I've been living a lie. There's nothing inside. Bring me to life. Songwriter Amy Lee says she didn't write that song about God. She wrote it about her husband or her husband who would be her man who would be her husband. Josh Hartzler, who years before, even before they were dating, looked across the table into her eyes and said to her, are you happy? And Amy Lee knew she was profoundly unhappy. And she looked down and she began to make excuses. She knew she'd been hiding and now she was found. Have you ever felt disconnected from your own self? Lost within your own skin? Adrift? As if you've wandered off the path of your own life and you might be actually living someone else's life? In different seasons of our lives, you know, maybe it's a job or a partner, our children, an illness, the death of a loved one. Maybe it's an addiction or a series of over or under commitments, or maybe it's the church, but something swallows us or feels like it swallows us up and we lose ourselves. I was feeling burned out when I asked our session back in early 2019 to form a team to allow me to apply for a sabbatical grant from the Lilly Clergy Renewal Endowment. In their words, Lilly Clergy Renewal programs provide an opportunity for pastors to step away from the persistent obligations of daily parish life and engage in intentional exploration and reflection. Grants give congregations funding, resources to provide time for their pastors to drink again from God's life-giving waters, to regain enthusiasm and creativity for ministry. After 15 years of heavy lifting and full-time parish ministry, I thought this sounded like such a gift. So we began to work on that application together. And one of the questions the Lilly Endowment team wanted us to address, what makes your heart sing? What makes your heart sing? Do you know? Well, the sabbatical support team knows I struggled with that question, which is probably why I needed a sabbatical. <laughs> My colleagues who had received grants, they wrote into their application about their love of motorcycling and their, their desire to just get on a bike and ride across some beautiful countryside. Or one wrote about his desire to study microbrewing in a monastery known for its beer because it had always been his dream to brew. What makes my heart sing? Maybe that's really why our grant was denied. <laughs> 
because they read so many applications, they could probably tell that when they read ours, I didn't know. And some of you have asked when we're going to reapply. And the Lilly literature says, it's crucial for the pastor to consider what he or she hopes to accomplish or achieve by this experience. I feel like I need a sabbatical to figure out how to fill out the application for the sabbatical. Although it was stressful in many ways, one of the gifts for me of this pandemic was an opportunity to build some different rhythms into my schedule, to find different ways to drink deeply from the beauty of nature, to listen and open my heart before God. So what makes my heart sing? Well, I don't think I can really fully articulate that yet, but God is teaching me. For Amy Lee, it was this question, are you happy? It shocked her heart. For King David, it was this truth teller, this prophet Nathan, who was willing to hold up a mirror so David could see and face the man he had become. So far from home, it drove him to his knees. Bring me back, we pray. Sometimes in confession, in grief, in boredom in discontent, in confusion, in exhaustion, in ennui, in workaholism, in whatever state of lostness we are, bring me back to life. And the good shepherd hoists us up on those broad shoulders and holds us close and brings us back. According to the story in the Gospel of Luke, there's two different celebrations. One, when the sheep is found... And that's an intimate celebration between the shepherd and the sheep. And the second one is when the sheep and the shepherd return home and return to community, when the sheep is brought back home to the rest of the flock. Because the work is not done. This work of healing, this work of refreshing the soul, the life within us, until it's whole within community. So without belonging, without purposeful work, without right relationships, the real celebration is not complete. It happens when it happens all together. It's flock integration time out at the farm. Some of you were at Vacation Bible School and you saw that we had two flocks. We had one that was seven, that is seven older hens. And then we have another flock that was 10, 10 adolescents. And so when you came out for vacation Bible school, they were separated. The adolescents were in an annex and the older girls were in their regular run. They could see each other through the fence, but they could not touch each other. They couldn't get close enough to each other. But then we started to bring the little girls into the coop at night, still in a cage, so they couldn't be touched, but so that they could be in that same space. And now we've opened the door. What do you think happened? <laughs> this is a tricky time. This is a tricky time because see the, the seven, they already have a pecking order established. They know who's who and they know what's what. And these adolescents, they don't know. They don't even know what they don't know. So here's what happened. First of all, the little ones, the youngsters, they have a lot of energy. So they just will randomly just jump up and run or they will jump up and fly. And the older girls don't do that anymore. They pretty much stay where they are. But when one of the little ones comes close to one of the older ones or comes close to the food that the older one's eating, there's a little warning. There's a little bit of a cluck or a peck to warn to move back. But here's what's interesting. When one of the older ones gets too aggressive with their discipline, one of the other older ones will peck her. As if to say, enough. It's fascinating. It's fascinating to watch this integration. Every day they get more comfortable with each other. Every day they make a little more room for each other 
So far, at least so far, it's starting to shift a little, but so far it's been the little ones who have been trying to initiate their role, their place into the established flock. They've been the ones that have been kind of trying to come over and say, can I be in here? Can I be in here? Can I be in here? Just, just in the last day, some of the older ones have started to go over where the younger ones are to see them, to get to know them a little bit. It's pretty fascinating. And I wonder, are there lessons for us as a church in this flock integration? As we're reforming community, especially in these days when authentic, genuine community is so desperately yearned for, as we're becoming a place of belonging, a place of purpose, a place of right relationships, integrating new and established practices, we're a little rusty as we re-enter our life together. We need to be reminded by the Good Shepherd how to do this, how to be this. Our mission statement, it's on our website, our mission statement says, we are a loving community of faith following Jesus Christ, where everyone has a place and a face, a story and a voice. Our minds, hearts, and hands are engaged as we humbly serve our neighbors near and far, come and see. Are we? Does everyone have a place? Do we see everyone? And what do we know about each other's stories? How do we learn to give and receive stories? How can this be a place where we listen and we hear each other's voices more completely, more respectfully, more genuinely? And how do we broaden the engagement of minds and hearts and hands? How do we make room and welcome all to deeper belonging. What an opportunity for us. What an opportunity to grow in wholeness, to celebrate life together. Oh, good shepherd, we pray, bring us back. Bring all of us back. Bring us back to life, that life that you uniquely place within each one of us. And bring us back to life full life, abundant life, together, we pray. Amen. Let's make our way to the family table. And we'll sing hymn number 501, and you can find it in your hymnal, or you can look at it up on the screen as a prayer of preparation. Feed us, Lord, we pray. invite you to continue to pray with me. And this prayer was offered to us by Presbyterian Church USA pastor Tom Schumann, who writes beautiful poetry and prayers and liturgy for worship. May the God of green pastures be with you. 
Beloved, still your hearts before God and open them to the one who fills them with living water. Children of God, give thanks for the sake of God's name. Let us pray together. Imaginative shepherd, into the bitterness of chaos, you poured pools of living water. Into the cracks of nothingness, you filtered dirt and seeds and nutrients so lush pastures of life might emerge. You carved paths of beauty and wonder for those who bear your name and image to walk. And we wandered, following a darker way. Over and over again, we have turned away from you. You gave your rod and your staff to prophets, trusting that their words might anoint us with healing, and yet we found comfort in false promises. And so in the presence of these enemies, we did not recognize you sent Jesus to be that grace and hope we needed. You are holy yet compassionate God of our hearts. And your good shepherd Jesus comes to save us. When we wander in the wilderness, he leads us to the green pastures of grace. When we foolishly turn down wrong roads, he takes our hands to show us the right path. When we are tossed about by life, he brings us back to the still waters of your gentleness. Walking through the darkest valley, Jesus surrendered to death on a cross until you brought him out of the grave, anointing him with the oil of resurrection. As we would join goodness and mercy in following the good shepherd all the days of our lives, we celebrate that mystery we call faith. You have prepared this table for us anointing the bread and the cup, as well as all of your people with the Holy Spirit. May this bread, which is broken, be our healing and strength. So we walk through the shadows of our world, leading our sisters and brothers down paths of healing and hope. As we are anointed with the cup's grace, may we bring comfort to the lonely, build homes for those who have none, fill the hungry with nourishing food, shower them with goodness and mercy. And when there are no more shadows around us, when your rod of reconciliation and your staff of salvation gather us around the table prepared for us in eternity, we will join all from every time and place, singing your praises with glad voices. God in community, holy in one. Hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. And we turn to you with a name he taught his earliest followers, Abba, our Abba, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus, as host of the meal, took the bread and after giving thanks, broke it and offered it to his friends, his followers, his disciples who shared the table, shared the meal with him and said to them, this is my body, broken and given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. So friends, every time we come to the table, whether it's here in our sanctuary, whether it's visiting someone at home and, and we take the bread and the cup to their bedside, whether it's in a hospital, wherever it is, when we remember the Lord Jesus together, we do remember his life, his ministry, his death, his rising again until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to come forward and the bread is gluten-free. I'll take the linens off so that you have them. And also on either side is a cup. So if you could take a cup of the juice and a piece of the bread, take it back with you and we'll share in the feast together. Thank you. 
Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Please join me in prayer. Let us go to be bold before God, giving voice to all people who long for healing and hope. Let us go to shepherd Jesus' sisters and brothers, offering our lives for justice and serving the outcast. Let us go to anoint others with the Holy Spirit, bringing goodness and mercy to all whose lives need restoring. Amen. This morning, we introduce the offering uh, of our deacons for the month of August, and it is for the migrant workers. And so we'll put a slide up on the, the wall here that talks a little bit about this. The migrant workers, we have worked with them now for a couple of years, Sister Nancy of the Adrian Dominicans, and she uh, works with them to identify the needs of their, uh, their dietary needs, the food needs that they have. And so we will do this collection during the month of August. Again, I, uh, our church so appreciates the generosity of the flock. This time, let us give with gratitude back to the Lord our God the gifts that we have received. Will the ushers please come forward? I do want to remind you that there are shawls, there are prayer shawls behind me up at the front of the church. If you know someone in your life that you believe would be comforted, would be encouraged, buy a prayer shawl, a gift, please choose one, take it and give it away. They're made to be given away as instruments of God's grace. And so please remember about that. And one new one is being dedicated this morning. Thank you to the hands that made it. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, for the opportunity to give back. Aware and conscious of all of the blessings you bestow upon us, a fitting and rightful response is a response of gratitude, a heart filled with joy and thanksgiving. And so it is a blessing, it is a privilege, it is an honor to be able to give. We give you thanks for that opportunity. And we ask that you would take these gifts and guide us in their distribution. Show us where the needs are. Plant within our hearts. Nudge us toward where we would turn your love and your grace through the hands and feet and heart of this church. Be with us, we pray. Amen. So our, our closing blessing will be followed with a song of prayer, Bless the Lord. 
and I'll extinguish the Christ candle. And then we do encourage you to move out of this space. And so there won't be a postlude. Francisco and I will walk out together. We'll kind of be, you can imagine us as your shepherds leading you out of this place and back out into uh, the gathering space or a wider space, maybe outside to fellowship together as our worship service comes to a close. But I will offer this blessing. This is written by Richard Fairchild. And it again is with the theme of the Good Shepherd. I'll offer the blessing. We'll, we'll have a moment of prayer with the music. We'll extinguish the Christ candle and we'll go in peace. So go in peace and love and care for another in the name of the Lord. And may God lead you to places of rest and renewal. May Christ Jesus give you life in abundance and may the Holy Spirit fill your hearts with gladness and generosity both now and forevermore. Amen. Yeah.